Okay, so let's start, I guess. If everyone's here, right? Okay, so let me start. Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us in the third Psyching Center in Psychology Club. Um, okay. <laughs> my name is Aisha Noor and I and my friend Zehra will be moderating this program. We as the Ibn Haldun Psychology Club are very excited to have a program focusing on music as a universal human practice that has been lasting, changing and evolving since the prehistoric times. Today, we have very significant and precious speakers who are going to be talking about the historical and psychological aspects of music as a universal human practice. We're going to start with Professor Mr. Bergtai's talk, and later we will continue with Ms. Perry. There will be a Q&A session at the end of presentations. Please feel free to contact us privately through chat and write your questions to our guests. Thank you. Before we start our program, we would love to give a brief introduction of our speakers' backgrounds. So to start with Ms. Gemma Perry, she is currently undertaking a PhD in psychology at Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia. Her PhD investigates the effects of repetitive sound meditation, chanting, on emotional, cognitive, and psychosocial processes. She describes herself as a teacher, researcher, presenter, and writer in the science of ancient practices as a tool for healing and realizing full human potential and awakening consciousness. Today, Ms. Perry will be focusing on the psychological aspects of music and chanting and what kind of change it leads to on human, behavioral and human, human behavior and minds. Mr. Halil Bartai is a historian, professor doctor at Ibn Hadin University formerly a faculty member at Sabanj University of Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. He completed his bachelor's and master's in economics in Yale University and his PhD in history in University of Birmingham. In the past, he worked as an assistant and lecturer at Ankara University, Faculty of Political Sciences, Metu, and Bodich University. He has taught at Michigan and Harvard Universities as a visiting professor, Today, Mr. Barktai will give us a perspective on the history of music and its relation with humanity and societies. Now, please, Professor Mr. Barktai, you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I can share screen, can I not? Um, yeah. I just, uh, this does not pretend to be a comprehensive history of music in any way. I would just like to, um, focus on uh, music as a different, a unique and untranslatable kind of language. With regard to any kind of translation, there is a problem of accuracy and authenticity. There is this famous saying in Italian that goes traduttore, traditore, that is to say to translate is to betray. And this is even more so with music extremely so with music, because as I've said, it is a totally different kind of language in itself, which is most of the time totally impossible to put into words, to express verbally. But the other side of the coin is that it has immense power to communicate, to express ideas, to evoke thoughts, feelings, emotions, to transport us into different worlds, to make us happy, laugh, cry, mourn, despondent, pensive. Sometimes we feel brave and heroic, ready and capable of rising to all kinds of challenges. Sometimes we feel lost. Sometimes we feel plunged and surrounded in a reverie, a dream world of some kind. Among all these and many others that music is capable of doing and surrounding us with, impacting on us. Today, I want to talk about what is probably the simplest or most common effect. That is to say, creating a sense of belonging, 
being part of a community or collectivity that comprises players, singers, and their audience, interacting with each other in different ways. And this, I would say, is largely achieved through rhythm, perhaps the most fundamental element of music, such a basic building stone that we really cannot think of music without it. I'm not a musicologist, I'm not a historian of music. As I've been saying in all kinds of such talks previously, I just happen to be a good listener. And of course, I have my historian's profession in the background. How music began, we cannot be sure. Did it begin by observing and imitating bird songs in nature or other animal sounds? as part of a process of hunting and gathering in order to attract them, in order to be able to get closer to them through mimesis, through imitation. Today in professional hunting, duck calls, deer calls, moose calls, etc. That is to say, uh, special kinds of whistles that hunters blow in order to call birds or animals to them are perhaps remotely reminiscent of this function? Or was there perhaps an initial function of coordinating labor processes, that is to say collective effort? Hauling stones for the pyramids or for Stonehenge or for erecting Egyptian obelisks, was there any kind of chant? Was there any kind of rhythm or percussion uh, accompanying that collective effort? Possibly, maybe probably, but we don't have them. But we do have something which seems to point to this function. We have, for example, the famous song of the Volga boatmen, the Volga burlaks or barge haulers, which was a Russian folk song discovered in the 1860s by one of the famous Russian five of composers, Balakirev, and it was published in his book of folk songs in 1866. And since then it has become world famous, sung by bass baritone singers and choruses all over the world. And also the subject of this most famous painting by Ilya Repin, and if I can share screen, I will show it to you. I hope you can all see it now. So here we have, here we have the Volga River. And here we have this heavy barge and cables stretch from the barge to this gang of burlaks on the shore and they have heavy straps going across their, uh, their chests. And the idea is that they make a one, two, one, two kind of effort to keep dragging the barge upriver against the current. Of course, if you are going downriver, you don't need barge haulers, but you need them to go into, to go against, uh, against the current. And this is, the famous, uh, hold on. I have to, I have to arrange for the advanced, right. Sorry for my technical ineptitude. Is there anything we can help? Can you hear the music now? No. Can you hear it now? Can you hear the music? Not really. Not, no, no. Hold on. There is an advanced application. Right, okay. 
uh, but share computer sound. This I did not expect. Um, um, now we now, are when I when I when I do screen share, there is um, uh, something that comes up saying advanced. Professor, we have just heard the music. Can you open it again? Maybe we can hear it again. Can you hear it now? Yes. Yes. of it i just like to note that there is a an equally beautiful turkish equivalent or counterpart about black sea sailors and here it is again uh professor before you start can i say something yes uh, please can you just a bit lower the music so that we can hear both the music and your sound uh is it okay okay i will i will try <laughs> okay, this is try. really demanding technically <laughs> okay uh let's see now uh Sarah, are you just are you just asking if he can talk separately to playing the music well he just tried to do that and he couldn't hear his voice properly yeah so we just can't hear you when you're talking as well as playing the music that's all Mola Hamo Yomu Hamo Bismillah Bashayan El Sayal Hesa Bizbu Ishi They are seamen on board the ship, holding the sails up, pulling them down, and doing all kinds of other kinds of heavy labor on board. But as you can see, there is a very close similarity between the rhythm, and it has to do with organizing and coordinating labor. Um, 
this is, I'm trying to suggest this is perhaps some primordial moment way back in the origins of music. And it somehow gives rise to a spreading and expanding idea of not just in terms of labor processes, but you know, in terms of creating a sense of affinity, identity, a sense of belonging to a community or collectivity in religion, in dancing, in tribal custom and tradition, in warfare, military music, marching bands, and it keeps expanding into different realms, this question of what we are made to belong to. So here I have... <laughs> It is, um, it is because of Pope Gregory the Great in the sixth century, who is said to have ordained a common process of liturgy and worship for the Roman Catholic rite at that time in the sixth century. It was originally only human voices, hence the term chant, but here in this particular well updated, shall we say, version, you can also hear an organ in the background accompanying the singers, but that was not supposed to be originally the case. And you have this. You have this east and west. You have it in uh, Shania Islam and Sufi Islam. And here we have an example of it. For this audience, I would say a familiar example of every right combining singing and dancing. modern 20th century composition. But of course, behind it, there is yet another medieval tradition, the medieval tradition of the Goliardic or the Gayardic poets. That is to say, not mainstream religiosity, but a kind of underworld twilight zone kind of 
religiosity. Monks who are no longer monks, who are no longer preaching, believing, worshipping monks, but have somehow become outcasts, marginals, and sunk into a twilight zone of maybe petty criminality, drinking, what would be considered sinful entertainment of all kinds in terms of mainstream Christianity. But they write songs. They write songs of all kinds about entertainment, about love, about women, about drinking, and about fortune. Fate, fate that seems to rule everybody's lives. And Having found this untapped manuscript in a monastery of these kinds of songs, Karl Orff, out of it, gives rise to a most famous piece of 20th century music. The opening section of the Karina Burana. Listen to the rhythm. Impossible to sit still, really. I mean, it gets into your blood after a point. You start bouncing up and down. kind of Maasai dancing, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is it possible for you to reduce your... Sorry? Yes, I'm
just very simply, uh, now this is in this, I think, in this last dance, you can see a stylized version of agricultural labor, harvesting processes. The gestures made by kneeling and cutting with a, a sickle. Uh, you have the war dance side by side with dances that arise out of agricultural labor. And always in all of these, the Volga boat hauler song, the Heyamol from the Turkish Black Sea, uh, and these last dances, and the Carmina Burana, and the uh, Gregorian or Mevlevi chants and uh, music. There is this common element of whether it is a war party or an agrarian production dance or collective labor or religious belief and worship, there is the common element of creating a community, creating a collectivity through chanting, through singing, through body language, and underlying it all, there is the question of rhythm. My apologies for having overstepped my time limits. Thank you. Thank you, dear professor. Um, now let's hear the uh, dear Gemma Perry's presentation about music and chanting and human uh, and its relation with human. Thank you for that. That was really wonderful. I just loved seeing all of those different examples of music and yeah, beautiful. Um, I shall uh, share my screen and we're going to uh, the science of it all, I guess, the psychology and um, also focusing on uh, chanting, which I'll explain a little bit more of so i'll just find this here <clears throat> okay so everyone can see the slide um it's a black screen right now oh black screen oh we're having all sorts of technical <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can try again. Right. Yeah, we can see it. Yes. Now. Yeah. I guess it will be show up right. <laughs> just before we we just sew it and okay. Um because it does say that I'm sharing it from my end. So do I need like a permission from you guys have given me the permission to share, right? I don't think so, but yeah, I guess we should, if we should wait a bit more, it will be show up that we can, like, we can see it. Okay, let me try Because again. of the internet or distance. You can see a slide. It you just says see. Gemma Perry has started screen sharing. I guess we're going to see it soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I can just start talking uh, while we're waiting for that. So, um, well, I'm going to be talking about chant. Look at the um, chanting on and social connection, and also I'm looking at altered states of consciousness as well um, for my PhD. 
So what's different about chanting and... I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, we saw some examples of... So chanting is... Yeah? Uh, can you hear me? I guess you're a bit cutting off. Is it the same for everyone? Maybe we can try... Uh, I mean, you can try... Uh, turning off your video that we can hear you better. Oh, okay. Um, can you see my screen yet? No. No. I no. Not, uh, can I share my screen? I have the slides. I have the slides. I can share my screen and Gemma can speak through the through my share screen. Is it okay? Sure. That's fine. Um, can you hear me okay? We can see you okay, okay. but we cannot see your screen shares. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, chanting, uh, so just that second slide there. If we can just... Yeah, great, thank you. So uh, chanting, it uh, often involves beliefs and traditions. Um, it's never considered a performance. So often with music, we have a performer and an audience. With chanting, it's a participatory thing. So everyone's participating. Um, it aims to specific goal with chanting and different traditions have different goals as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay, so if we can, yeah, thank you very much. So this just gives us uh, some different examples of uh, different traditions that are chanting. So we have in India, Sikhism, they're chanting to memorize texts and also to um, honor their form of God. Uh, in ancient Egypt, there were frescoes depicting people with instruments and they think that they used to chant to actually make the Nile flood. Uh, so they believed that it was important for their crops. Then we have Indigenous Australians. Uh, they would chant to um, navigate the land and also to uh, pass information down from generation to generation. Um, the Navajo in um, America, so second largest Native American tribe, they would chant to heal the community and protect the community. Uh, in India, there's Vedic chanting. They use like a ceremonial things like fire and they put lots of herbs and um, different offerings into the fire. And then we have Buddhist chanting, which can be done like this man here sitting by himself silently, but it can also be done in groups uh, vocally. So is the sound okay and everything's yeah, okay, right great. Now, so if we go to the next slide. Okay, if the next slide will show us like a little bit of a video of uh, some, a chanting example. If you just press play on that. Wait a minute. Mm. So this, uh, this particular one you hear is it? called Takatina. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
I continue? Thanks. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so that's called Takatina and Takatina was developed by a composer and it's about maintaining these three separate rhythms. So they're clapping, they're chanting and they're stepping in three different rhythms. And it's very difficult to do even for musicians. So the point is not to make music as such, but it's actually to get people into these trance-like states. So there's this focus um, of creating an experience for people. Uh, so if you go into the next slide, and you can just press play for a few seconds here, please. Okay, that's fine. I don't think we can really hear that very well, so that's fine. I can, um, you can stop that doesn't seem to be working very well. So that's actually a Vedic chant and I just thought I'd demonstrate myself, why not? So it's Om Namo Narayani Om Namo Narayani and they're just repeating over and over and over again. So chanting, we were um, speaking a little bit before, it's not really about what you sound like. It's just like anyone can chant and um, it's really about participating and having this experience. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see if we can play that video. This is a call and response style chant. Um, maybe if you just take it further along the video. Yeah. I think I had these set in. Should I go more? Yeah, that's fine. We can try it there. It's. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So that's like a call and response uh, style chanting. It's like a musical conversation, if you like. So he says, you know, rade, rade, and then everybody responds, rade, rade, and it's this little conversation. Uh, so if we go to the next slide and just talk about some of the benefits of chanting. So we have neurological effects. Um, it can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, decrease stress and anxiety, and it can increase mindful attention. So not just attention, but mindful attention, which is when we're um, objectively aware of our thoughts. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so this was a study that we did at Macquarie University. This was um, my master's in psychology. And we had people come and chant in a group and they just made the sound om, and we did that with a recording in a group. So we did two studies, actually, one was for my honours and one was for my master's. So the first one was for 10 minutes and we tested stress and altruism. So altruism being the selfless concern for others. Um, I'm not sure whether you've noticed, it's pretty rare. <laughs> it's rare. Um, people, you know, like I guess we were looking at, uh, there were questions such as, would you donate to a charity? Would you give up your seat on a bus? Would you help a friend move house? That kind of a thing. And after chanting in a group for 10 minutes together, people were more likely to be basically kinder people. Um, and also they had decreased stress as well. So we measured stress with uh, cortisol in saliva as well as psychological stress. 
So if you'd like to play the video, I'm not sure whether that's going to go the whole way, but we'll see. You want me? Like I can play? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. I went to Macquarie University in Sydney to participate in some group chanting. So just getting comfortable, relaxed. They took a sample of my saliva to test levels of the stress hormone cortisol. <laughs> and the questionnaire looked at how altruistic and in touch I was with my fellow humans. So everyone closing the eyes and just feeling as relaxed as you can in this moment. For the chanting to have any effect, we're going to have to go for around 12 minutes. So please enjoy another 11 and a half minutes of chant. All right, we'll edit it down a little bit. By the end, the group was much more synchronized with our chants. And whenever you're ready, just opening the eyes again. One more round of paperwork and a bit more saliva and we're done. But what are the effects? After the chanting, both your self-report stress and physiological stress, which we measured with the saliva and the cortisol, they also both decreased it's possible that the increase in social connection is affecting the decrease in stress. You were basically a nicer person. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. So yeah, that was um, uh, ABC, they came and did our experiment. So it's just a really nice summary of what we did. Uh, so if you go into the next slide and there's just some of the measures that we used. So salivary cortisol, so before chanting and after chanting, uh, collecting people's saliva and looking at um, cortisol levels. And also we did um, altruism and state trait anxiety inventory. And so if we go to the next slide, please, thank you. That just shows um, the chanting ORM decreased the physiological and the psychological stress. And we compared silent and vocal chanting. So even just listening to the chanting had an effect. How are we going for time here? Okay, like five more minutes or something? Sure. It's okay. okay. Yeah, okay, great. So the next slide, please. So um, last year we did a study and we had planned to do another study of group chanting and then COVID happened. And so we all went into lockdown and everything went online. So we tested chanting online. So we had a group chanting and an individual condition. So you can see the researcher in both of those um, there with the, uh, the green background. And we tested uh, psychological stress and connection to the group and people were listening to a recording and chanting along with that recording and stress also decreased. So that was really interesting to find that online chanting works as well. So if we go to the next slide, and that's some of the measures that we used. Um, again, we used the um, anxiety and positive affect, negative affect, and then an inclusion. Uh, so we looked at how connected people felt. So they would, they would choose one of those Venn diagrams to show how connected they felt to that group. And they were feeling more connected in the chanting condition than the control condition, which was just listening to something. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so why do we care about any of this, I guess, is because stress is um, incredibly harmful for our health. Uh, so it can be related to depression, anxiety, a weaker immune system, heart disease, and then we have like conventional therapies are not always effective. So it's great that we can have another way of reducing stress. So yeah, next slide. Um, altruism is also really great for health. So it's not actually just the person that's receiving uh, your service. Actually, the person that is doing the selfless service has been found to be mentally and physically healthier. They have a more positive mood, decreased symptoms of depression, anxiety. And so, yeah, everyone, everyone benefits there. Next slide. 
So how does chanting work? Uh, so there's a few different um, things happening with music and chanting. So we have attention, synchrony, rhythm, repetition, and often a belief system. So all of these things are working like independently and also together. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we'll go through each of those. So attention, um, with chanting, you're focusing on a sound. So some traditions will say, focus on a sound. If you notice that you're not focusing on the sound, focus on the sound. So that's all you have to do. And so this trains our attention and it decreases mind wandering. Um, we know from a study done in the US that the average person spends 47% of their time not paying attention to what they're doing. I'm pretty sure that we could translate that to, you know, Turkey and Australia and England, um, you know, um, and yeah, increased mindful attention, disengagement from automatic thought processes. So I would argue that any sound is going to be better than a lot of the rumination that happens in our, in our mind. So, you know, when am I going to have my next coffee? What's for dinner? Um, when's my next exam? All of these stressful thoughts. And so um, chanting can help with that. If we go to the next slide. Synchrony, uh, we spoke a little bit about synchrony uh, before. So creating social connection with entrainment, perception, action coupling. So when I'm seeing somebody else clapping and tapping their foot, I'm responding to that and it's helping me to feel more connected. And then that's all related to the, the great neurohormones, you know, dopamine, serotonin and oxytocin. Uh, next slide. Uh, rhythm and repetition. So this can, in relation to altered states of consciousness and things like that, it can actually diminish our sense of time and space. So we can have um, flow states where um, people feel like they, they lose a sense of themselves and they're just so absorbed in the task, in this case it would be chanting, that they just lose a sense of time and space and, and who they are. Um, simultaneous perception. So as we saw with the Takatina, they're trying to clap and sing and step all at the same time and that's keeping them um, busy enough to not be involved in, you know, other ruminative thought patterns and that can inhibit the self-referential thought so belief and faith yeah no we can go to the next one that's, that's great so when with the chanting they there are many different traditions and they don't have to involve a belief but they often do and this can enhance the attention enhance the synchrony and um you know goal setting while chanting and also we know that people that have a very strong belief system are better able to interpret mystical experiences that they have while chanting. Okay, yeah, next slide. The next slide is just about the fact that anybody can chant at any time. We've got all the tools. Um, if, you know, like you wanna give it a go, you can like even humming, even just hmm, If you try that, you'll find, um, you know, if you try it three, five times, if you're feeling a little bit stressed, it can change your breathing rate. And also with humming, they find that it um, creates nitric oxide, which we need for our immune system. So there's vibrations in like the nasal cavities that create this kind of, um, yeah, nitric oxide. So that's it. I think the last slide is just saying thank you to some of the amazing people I work with, um, Professor Bill Thompson, Vince Polito, and some of the um, people that show me chanting, Dr. Shankadev Saraswati and Sri Shakti Amar. So that's it. Thank you. So we have some questions from the participants. Um, so we are going to ask those questions. There are some questions for both Professor uh, Mr. Helen Berkdai and Mr. Perry, Mrs. Perry. Um, wait a minute, please. <laughs> So one of the questions is that 
does it always decrease these depressive symptoms? What about the opposite effect, increasing sadness and depression? This is the question. Should I write it to uh, chance? Did you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shall I talk a bit about that? Or Professor, did you want to say anything? No. Um, I think that's a really fantastic question. Um, so, yeah. So I don't know of any studies that have been done that have found um, the opposite effect but that's not to say that it cannot happen. So, um, yeah, I think this depends on so many different factors. You know, like with science, what we do is we take, you know, the majority of people and we say this is what happens. But a lot of the time there's, you know, an outlier or a different experience and it may not always be a positive experience. I think... Overall, so what, what can happen is I can do a chanting session. So maybe I do, sometimes people do them in groups or by themselves. I might do a chanting session and afterwards I will feel absolutely amazing. Like I can just take on anything or I might feel the opposite and I might feel um, not so great. Um, so the, the key I think with that is the mindfulness. So as long as you um, are staying mindful and objectively observing that experience, then that's what's important. Like we're not going to be happy all of the time. So yeah, so we have to allow ourselves to feel things. And sometimes with the chanting, um, you know, there's no science on this, but if you if you basically, um, or even with mindfulness research, you can bring unconscious, unconscious thoughts to the surface that were not already there. So I might not have been aware of some of the things that go on in my mind. And then through chant or through mindfulness, I can become more aware of them. And that can sometimes be um, disturbing if if people find uh, negative thoughts or something like that so it's really important to have teachers or guides um, that can help us through that hopefully that answered a little bit of the question i think your answer was great there was another question i am sharing them on the chats for everyone so that you can read as well so uh, it says that there are different types of music worldwide and uh, we know that we can build emotional bonds between types of emotions and different types of music. Can we say that our brains create memories that are patterned according to the music we listen to? You can read it on the chat. I'm just rereading it. So there, there are different um, types of music worldwide and we know that we can build emotional bonds between types of emotions and different types of music. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, like music means different things to different people at different times. So like we definitely form like identity and memories through music. So for example, if you have a loved one and you have a favorite song that you share with that person, and then all of a sudden you have a falling out with that person. And when you hear that music, you no longer think of the fun times. You think of, you know, you might be angry with that person. You might be grieving that person. You might be really sad. And so that is, is going to impact how you hear that song. And also um, what music we're exposed to um, in different cultures. I mean, different cultures is a really important one, even in different families. 
um, and different, like, you know, the, the music that my parents listen to is different to the music that I listen to and it might be the same for you as well. And so that's all going to, to have an effect. It's, it's a very, it would be a, a difficult study to do um, with science because um, there's a lot of variables in those questions, but it's, yeah, it's definitely about what we're exposed to and how familiar we are with the music. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that, that creates another question or... I think there are lots that definitely like lots of questions with just one question. So the, the there there is the continuum of the question. Uh, I think it is for Mr. Bergtai. Um, it is more about the societies, like for example, listening to a nationalistic song during the times of war or any other hardship that your country is facing. Uh, Professor Mr. Bergtai, do you believe that certain societies create bonds? with certain kinds of music intrinsically. I will write it on chat again. Um, this, is, uh, this is implicit in uh, what I've been saying. Uh, music is very effective, immensely powerful, as I said, in terms of creating around this or that kind of content, this or that kind of community. So uh, yes, I mean, it can be, uh, uh, well, uh, an enormous amount has been written about the connection between the French Revolution and Beethoven's symphonies, how uh, Beethoven's music is in many ways, especially his public works, his symphonies, some of his piano sonatas, are inseparable from ideas of revolution or of, shall we say, heroically storming the heavens and turning society upside down and challenging what had hitherto been thought to be unchallengeable, overthrowing the establishment, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, military music of all kinds, from the Crusades uh, down to the present, War is, whether we like it or not, a very distinctive and very extreme kind of human behavior. And military music can be used, has been used throughout the ages to, to impose drill and discipline, uh, marching in step, acting in step, complete obedience to orders, uh, performing, functioning as a unit uh, in very, very strictly trained uh, fashion, surrendering your consciousness, your individual consciousness and volition, submerging it entirely and hearing nothing but your officer's commands in effect. Uh, and of course, nationalistic music, of all kinds, different nationalisms. I would say that Elgar's music, for example, in, uh, in Great Britain is inseparable from the overall environment of Victorian imperialism and colonialism. I mean, it is, uh, it is, this, it is the British empire when he, writes, uh, uh, when he writes the Enigma variations or when he writes uh, 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 Pomp and Circumstance marches, it is not just any neutral pomp and circumstance we are talking about. We are, we are talking about the British Empire and British imperialism. Um, uh, we are talking about, shall we say, the musical counterpart of uh, Rudyard Kipling or Baden Powell, uh, uh, the Scouts organization and Kim and uh, uh, India uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, uh, Starting with the Marseillaise in the, uh, uh, in the French Revolution, born during the French Revolutionary Wars, and continuing throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. If you look at, it is very interesting to look at national anthems, to look at the music and the texts, the lyrics of 
various national anthems and how they appeal to the nation as an imagined community, how uh, I would say in Benedict Anderson's terms, they take an imagined community and they try to make it into a real community uh, of acceptance and uniformity of uh, opinion and emotion and uh, going along with the national line, going along with the national leadership, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and as I've said, you can see this uh, starting from the Marseillaise onwards. Uh, you can see it in all national anthems throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So yes, uh, I mean, this is uh, it's a kind of question that carries its answer within itself. Uh, of course, uh, you can have uh, you can have different kinds of revolutionary music. Uh, you can have Russian and Soviet revolutionary music coming out of uh, the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War, uh, and you can have uh, uh, you can have also. I would say that it also is a kind of uh, revolutionary music. You can have fascist and Nazi music. The Italian fascist national anthem, Giovinezza, Youth, is a very strong example of this. And it is powerful. It is effective. <laughs> Regardless of my dislike for it, I would have to say that, uh, I would have to say that it is, uh, it is enormously effective. It was enormously effective in fascist Italy for something like more than two decades. Thank you so much, Mr. Bakhtai. Now we have a, we have questions for both Mr. Bakhtai still and for Ms. Perry. So the next question is for Ms. Perry. Um, I think this is really a good question. I, I would like to ask a question to Ms. Perry. Does the reason why you chant affect your chanting benefits, like doing it as a part of belief or doing it just for personal relaxing can present different consequences of chanting? Is there any research uncovers that distinction? These are really fantastic and really difficult questions. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I think so, but the research is still very, very new in the world of chanting. Um, we might have to, like, with something like that, you might be able to draw on other research, which I'm not sure of the answer either, but like placebo effect and things like that and how people um, with beliefs do seem to... Um, get better, you know, taking a sugar pill, you know, because they believe that it's going to work and things like that. We have looked generally at belief systems in our research. So we've looked at whether people are high in religiosity, are they more likely to have altered states of consciousness with chanting? And we found that they are, but we don't have um, the distinction yet of this person was chanting, you know, for health and this person was chanting for pain in their arm and did that, you know, um, did that improve things? We don't know, but belief systems do seem to be incredibly important in many areas. So I would believe that that would be the case. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um we have another question for Professor Bagtai. Um, uh, it says that as language is in constant change through time and generations whose way of lives change as well, how does this affect the music that is listened to? Is it possible to say whether the change of societies affect the change of music or a change of music affect the change of societies or is it both? And how does this relationship go? Uh, I can share the question with you on chat as well. Yeah, on one level, uh, this is like uh, the chicken and the egg, which comes first. Does the egg come out of the chicken or the chicken come out of the egg? My, my quick reflex would be, does it have to be a binary opposition? Uh, does it have to be either one or the other? Do they have to be 
mutually exclusive. That is to say, changing society is affecting music, changing music affecting societies. Um, I would say very pedantically, very obviously both. It's like all culture, all knowledge, all science, all ideas. Um, what I would like to emphasize is that there is not a one-to-one -one deterministic connection. Uh, that is to say, going from society to culture, going from society to music. Um, the kind of economy, the kind of society you have does not necessarily determine in a one-to-one -one way what kind of music you have, what kind of music you listen to, what kind of music you produce and enjoy. Because there are these cause and effect relationships between, of course it has an influence, of course, certain societies, certain modes of existence, the material and immaterial conditions of human existence do have an impact on the kind of culture, including music, that they eventually produce and keep producing through the ages. This is not just a vertical relationship. There are also all kinds of horizontal relationships involved, including contact with and impact of other societies, other cultures, cultural and musical exchanges, interchanges, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, in this regard, I think it is important not to dichotomize between what we consider to be, in quotation marks, ours in a certain sense, and in that equally narrow sense, what we consider to be theirs or not ours. Especially since the 19th century, as we keep going through successive waves of globalization and successive waves of worldwide cultural, artistic, musical exchanges, interactions, it becomes very important not to dichotomize in this sense. And uh, cultural imports, if we want to use that word, do end up, I'm not against cultural imports. I have no generic opposition to cultural imports. They do end up sometimes having a profound impact on the society, on the culture into which they make their way. In the 19th century, Ottoman society does not have yet Western classical music and it does not have modern military music. Composers are imported from Italy and elsewhere. Before Abdul Hamid II and even more strongly in the Hamidian era, Donizetti Pasha and others to come in and compose Western style military marching music and organize marching bands so that the imminently modernizing Ottoman army can be in fact modern army because the establishment realizes that if you are going to have fully disciplined and functional modern armies like Europe, so that the Ottoman Empire can hold its own against European imperialism and colonialism, you have to have that kind of army. And if you are going to have that kind of army, you've got to have that kind of music because music and drill and discipline go hand in hand in a very strong, a very profound way. William H. McNeil has written a whole book about it called Drill and Discipline, Keeping in Step, Drill and Discipline, which is very worth reading. So if we consider, for example, the Young Turks and the Kemalists, 
the Young Turks and the Kemalists, who took over the fate of the late Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century, and then fought and won the national struggle and promulgated the modern republic, they are unthinkable without this music. I don't mean they are necessarily lovers and admirers of this music, but their entire social and military culture has been shaped by an overall cultural framework in which the importation and adaption and adoption and internalization, internalization of Western music in various forms played a crucial role. They are you cannot separate a professional career officer from a certain type of military band and marching music. And it is part of their culture. It is part of their hierarchy of their chain of command. Uh, you know, uniforms, the, the word uniform goes hand in hand with a certain kind of uh, cultural and indeed uh, musical formation. Whether you like it or not, this has enormous impact, these musical uh, uh, connections, etc. Uh, I was unable uh, in my original presentation, I mean, consider the reverse, consider Turkish impact, consider Ottoman impact on Europe. Ottoman armies expanding into the Balkans, through the Balkans, into central Hungary, from the capture of Belgrade 1521, the Battle of Mohac 1526, the second siege of Vienna 1683. Ottoman armies and Ottoman military music, Mehter bands, Janissaries, Janissary music, was embedded in the heart of Europe, in the heart of Central Europe for nearly 200 years. Uh, and it made an impact. There is something called the Marcia Alla Turca, the Turkish march. It is a well-known mode in, for example, both Mozart and Beethoven. Mozart has two famous examples of the Marcia Alla Turca, the Turkish march, in his entire 11th piano sonata, and also in the third movement of his fifth violin concerto. In Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the fourth movement, the famous choral movement, the main theme of the fourth movement, when it is introduced early in the fourth movement, through first the oboes, and then keeps spreading into the string section, that is a Marcia alla Turca rhythm. So you have, you, it is, I think it is important. Uh, Mozart associated with the enlightenment and with free thinking, including Masonic thought and Janissary music creeping up in Mozart in some of his most famous and popular works. Beethoven associated very strongly with the French revolution. And again, in his famous Ode to Joy, uh, which was probably actually intended as a kind of ode to freedom. You have this crucial rhythmic element of a Janissary Mehter band's march, of course adapted, reworked, very sophisticated, very refined, etc. Nevertheless, it's a Marcia alla Turca. So we have to we have to think about the universality, the universalism, the global and the local. This is crucial. It is an important matter to what extent local elements can be upgraded into and can be integrated into a global universality. And before our eyes, it has been happening for many centuries. Thank you, Hoja. Um, Zehra, I guess you have a question. Uh, we have two more questions and we are going to finish the program. You have, I hope you have time for two more questions, right? Our speakers. <laughs> okay. No problem um, with me. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, I think Gemma, this is for you. 
I'm going to share it right now. So music is spiritual rituals of the cultures worldwide and its effects are gathered under the term chanting in your research. And um, could you tell us a bit more about it? Do you see any relationship between catharsis and music? Wow. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all of these incredibly difficult questions. Um, so I first, first, before I answer this, I just wanted to go a little bit um, reverse back to the, um, the, the question about the belief systems and the chanting, um, because I did forget to mention that there are many different sounds for different reasons and different purposes. So people chant a specific sound for confidence, or they chant a specific sound for relaxation or they chant a specific sound for healing. And so there are belief systems also enmeshed in different sounds as well. You know, if you say, that's not very relaxing, but if you go, you know, that's very relaxing. So I just wanted to go back to that for a moment. And this one, just, is it written down here now? Yeah, musical spiritual rituals of cultures worldwide and its effects are gathered under the term chanting. Um, it's necessity to be mentally healthy. So is music necessary to be mentally healthy? Um, I think that it includes two questions. Like, do you see any relationship between catharsis and music? And do you see any relationship between being mentally healthy and listening to music? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this depends um, on the person and what their experience is. Um, for me, uh, like my passion, my passion into this research actually comes from the fact that it was necessary for me to be mentally healthy um, because I had an experience of uh, severe depression um, about 12 years ago. And I was into yoga. And so yoga is, a, you know, they use a lot of chanting in yoga. Um, and somebody told me to try chanting. And so for me, it was incredibly necessary for my mental health. And it is why I do the work that I do. Um, and I'm sure that's uh, similar for many other people. Um, but they also can find uh, different aspects in other, in other forms of um, life, you know, like people, some people will cycle together or um, move together, dance together, um, whatever they do. Um, but yeah, it depends where you are. It depends who you are and it depends what you, what you need. I mean, in Indigenous cultures, um, music was needed, I guess, for survival, you know, like it, it enhances memory and things like that. And so they would use it. They would like see a rock and know that rock is, and then, you know, sort of chant or sing about that rock and have a story about that rock to help enhance their memory to find water or to find, you know, food, um, and then pass that information down to, um, to other generations. So it can actually be even just survival. Um, relationship between catharsis and music. So what, um, who, who's asking this question? <laughs> um, in terms of like expressing emotion and is that the kind of? I think it is a kind of emotion that uh, brings relief. Mm, yeah. So yeah, like you can, as far as research, I'm not sure. There's things around emotional regulation, um, using it for emotional regulation or using different techniques. Um, and there's some people in our lab at Macquarie University that do some research into really extreme metal music, if you've heard anything like it. And I think that that can be a form of catharsis for the fans of that music. 
it can be absolute torture for the people that are not fans of that music, by the way. Like some people do not want to hear that music, but for people that do enjoy that music, they find some kind of um, channel to, you know, like they, they can channel these emotions into the music and they can feel actually uplifted by music that um, might do the opposite for, for somebody else. Um, and certainly with the chanting, uh, with, with chanting, a lot of it is very devotional. Um, and so in the chanting, it's a way of expressing um, your devotion for God or um, whatever the belief system is. Um, and that, yeah, again, I'm not sure if I've answered the question. I'm just fumbling around. I think it was an amazing answer. Thank you. I think Aisha, it's your turn. Uh, you have a question. Can I, uh, at some point, can I personally try to answer this question about catharsis and music? Sure. <laughs> Very simply, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about my personal experience. Um, it has that kind of impact on me. On me. I mean, the the great composers that I like, the great pieces of music, and I lose myself in them. I, I can try to put this in maybe theoretical terms. Um, I mean, we've looked at barch holler songs, tribal music, whatever, folk dances, etc., And there, there is an undivided community. Shall we say the performers, the singers, the players, and the audience in chanting or in extended versions of chanting and like the Maasai dances or Greek or Turkish folk dances, there is a unity of performers and audience. Perhaps that is why we cannot speak strictly of performance. It's all one. But then what happens is, as modernity develops, this is split. This is partitioned, fractured, division of labor. You get performers on a stage, a symphony orchestra and its conductor, or Pavarotti, or Sviatoslav Richter, or whatever. And you are the listener. Nevertheless, whether in concert, in actual concert, or when I'm listening, when I'm watching a video on the internet or on television, etc. I think there comes into play a special chemistry. I don't know how else to, uh, how else to put it. It happens to me, it may be happening to other members of the audience, though so I've never conducted a survey. That is to say, I get this immense earth. I feel so much a part of the music. I can hardly control myself. I can hardly stop myself from beginning to sing the chorale of the Ninth Symphony or a Schubert lead or uh, uh, whatever. I can hardly stop myself from beginning to tap my foot uh, on the concert hall floor. Uh, and I feel this tremendous urge to be part of that, to be inside that symphony orchestra, to be inside that string quartet or that piano quintet, uh, whatever. Uh, I tend to identify with, I tend to heroize and ide idealize and to merge my own identity with the virtuoso pianist or the vir virtuoso uh, violinist or uh, Pavarotti or, uh, or whatever. And I think that in that instance of absorbing the music and getting lost in it, there arises a partial, a momentary kind of recovery of the original community shall we say, the undivided community of uh, performers and audience, performers and participants where that division of labor has not yet taken place. I don't know. I don't know if this makes sense, but this is, this is a personal statement about how strongly I feel about music. 
Yeah, it, it happens to us, I guess, as well. Like we sometimes lose ourselves in the music and like leave the emotion, leave the atmosphere. Um, I guess um, Gizem has to say something about the, the question, right? Gizem, can yes. you unmute yourself? Yes, uh, actually, I asked the, the relationship between catharsis and uh, music. And I also think in, our, in another level, both individual catharsis and collective experience of catharsis through oaths, out large, for example. Yani, I was thinking how to translate oaths. I don't know, Aishanur, can you? What is oath in English? Um, maybe Professor Halim <laughs> can help. <laughs> I don't know. It's like yeah um, because more mourning for the deaths of us song, I know. like in a literature way yeah, I don't yeah. Know. and uh, like there's a tradition in uh, especially eastern culture uh, it's an organization they are song singing in the uh, morning day and they are singing so like cathartic way and it, it also becomes part of the culture. Uh, th uh, there are uh, these kind of songs for the important people, for example. I wonder that if this kind of songs causes a, a collective catharsis, like a catharsis of a group, uh, those, uh, these songs, a family, for example, or uh, a nation. I was wondering that, and I also uh, agree with the individual catharsis uh, in the metal song, especially. Like, uh, I am very fun of uh, metal kind of music, and I really feel that too. But can you please uh, further uh, elaborate uh, if you think there's a collective catharsis through uh, music? Thank you. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. So, I have been contemplating this a little bit more as well the conversation continues. And there's a few different things. Um, one is what I was saying before about the different goals and the different sounds um, and sometimes a different style of chanting that goes with it. So that would create a collective um a collective goal or feeling or channeling of something. So some traditions, uh, for example, I'm not sure whether you've heard of Krishna, uh, Krishna consciousness. Um, there are, they, they sing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And they actually sing it around the streets and they are just so passionate about this mantra. And it's all about their love for a, a deity called Krishna. And so as they sing that, they just sing with such devotion and love and joy. And there's definitely um, a collective, yeah, um, movement there. And there's also um, in thinking about, I'm not sure whether we, we got the translation for that word, but it was like mourning um, the death of, yeah, so there are some um, uh, Maori traditions in New Zealand and they have, I'm not sure, you may have seen the haka, which is like a chant, which is like a war chant. And they actually often do it before football games. It's the only time you will ever see me watch anything near the football is I just watch the haka and then I turn it off <laughs> because it's this really fantastic chant and they have these really you know um, these movements that go with the chant and it's actually quite terrifying like to be on the other side of it it's a war chant you know and they sort of really come together and they get all this power for the game you know for this football game and with the haka, there's actually all of these different hakas. So there's one um, for a wedding and there's one for a funeral and there's, you know, there's many different ones. And so that is when the, um, the group will come together and do a particular chant in order to uh, release those emotions and um, honour the, the person that has died. So that's one of the examples that I, I know of. 
um, yeah, with the mourning of somebody. And I think it would be just, I mean, I'm not involved with that. I've never had that in my culture. So I'm not really sure um, what it's like, but I'm, I'm a big believer in something like that. And I do, I do have the experience of a friend who was a very, um, a very passionate chanter and he was a drummer. And at his funeral, we actually, I've never seen a funeral quite like it. We chanted and drummed all the way up the hill, you know, and it was just everybody that went to that funeral said that they wanted a funeral exactly like that. <laughs> so, so I think it can be really powerful to do something like that in a collective mourning situation, yeah. Okay, thank you for uh, your answers and your presentations. I'm really amazed by the topic, by your presentations. It was really amazing for me and for our, I guess, for the participants as well. It, it was really a good um, conversation, I guess. Thank you. As every beautiful thing has an end, our program has to end as well. Thank you everyone for joining us in the Torch Psyching series of Ibn Hadun Psychology Club. And many thanks to our dear speakers for accepting our invitation for this program. It has been a lovely and fruitful time for all of us. Thanks for allowing us to benefit from your knowledge and time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed and Professor, your passion and knowledge. I just, yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you for organizing. Uh, my pleasure. Very nice to have met you again, ma. Uh, do I do I detect a note of uh, how shall I say regret or chagrin uh, in an Australian rugby fan having suffered long at the hands of the All Blacks and the and the Haka? <laughs> I, I honestly, I just, yeah. I they've, just been, like they've, they've, been, they've been making everybody suffer for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Hakka. I love the, I love, I love, I love the way they perform it. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the New Zealand rugby teams. Yes, amazing. Okay, sorry. I couldn't resist it's that. No, it's really great. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for everything. See you guys. See you guys. See you.